All right, so it's been a few weeks since we've been in Romans, but uh, we're going to pick it up again where we left off. We left off in chapter 8, verse 17, and today we're going to look at verses 18 down to 27. Uh, the section actually goes to the end of verse 30, and I'll explain why in a moment, but we're only going to look, go in terms of our study today to verse 27. So let's um, have your Bibles open and follow along with me as I begin. I'm going to begin reading from verse 14, so you get these early verses in technical context. Okay, verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom you cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. <clears throat> for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because, him, but because of him who subjected it, in hope, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So last time, as I mentioned, we ended at verse 17. And it's, and it's important that we again understand particularly what the last line of verse 17 says. But to help us to get there, Let's just go back to verse 14 for a second. Because in verses 14 to 7, 17, as, I've, as we've already read, Paul introduces two concepts. Uh, the first concept is that we are sons of God. So it's by the Spirit, if we are led by the Spirit of God. So in other words, if you are in Christ, you have the Spirit, and the Spirit leads you. And the Spirit leads you to, um, to verse 13, what does it say? to uh, put to death the deeds of the body. So if the Spirit is leading you in putting to death the deeds of the body so that you have victory over sin in your lives, it says then you know that you are a son of God. So that's in the first concept, that we are sons of God. The second concept is similar to it, but totally different. And that is that we are now adopted children of God. Okay, he says there in verse 15 that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs. Now you say to me, well, wait a minute, what's the difference between being a son and being a child? Aren't they really the same things? Okay, well, the difference is, is and I'm going to tell you the difference here <laughs> in a second, but you are all sons. So whether you're, you're a girl or whether you're uh, um, a boy, you are a son of God because he's not talking about the familial relationship with God. Let me explain to that. In order to understand the difference between a son of God and a child of God, you have to go back to how it's understood in the Old Testament. Now, we can't go to any Old Testament verse that talks about um, a king of a nation and his relationship to his God, other than Daniel, but it's not direct there. And, and that to reminds us that every king is the son of his God. All right, so uh, to help you to see that, um, turn to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. Verse 
Okay, this is the story of the uh, fiery furnace, but it begins with Nebuchadnezzar, who is the king of Babylon. And what is he doing? He's building what? He builds a big image, a statue, a huge statue. Now, nobody knows for certain what the statue is. Some say it was a statue of Nebuchadnezzar. Others say it's a statue of the god that he worshipped. Okay, and, and others think that it's probably, or quite possibly, a statue of Nebuchadnezzar and his god. You see, the two were, were, were close together. So that when Babylon went to nations in battle and conquered them, they conquered them in the power of their God, or in the name of their God. So they would come and they would beat the, the nations, and then, and then they would bring those nations into subjection, not only to the king, but to their God. So they have to abandon their gods and now follow the king's God and worship the <laughs> king's God. So this is probably what he was doing. He probably uh, himself and, and his God, and if it's not of himself, it was probably more like he is God because he said, when you hear the, the, um, the, the chimes ring, then everybody is to bow down and worship my God because it's my God that gave us the victory over all of our enemies. And the king is the son of God. That's the relationship that he has. He is the, the, the son of God. The king is the son. So, again, um, it's not a family relationship, but it's an alliance relationship. Okay, so the, the king has an alliance with his God. And, um, and it's almost like when they go to battle, the one king shouts out, Hey, my God's stronger than your God. And the other king responds back and he says, No, my God is stronger than your God. So how are we going to know? How are we going to know whose God is stronger? They're going to fight. They're going to battle together. Okay, I'm battling with my God. You battle with your God. And we'll see whose God is stronger. Well, of course, the victor yells out and says, See, I told you, my God is stronger. So, so when you look at Nebuchadnezzar here in Daniel chapter 3, look at verse 15. Okay, he builds this statue. He tells them to, to bow down to it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they would not bow down to it. He says in verse 15, Who's the God who's going to deliver you out of my hands? Okay, in other words, he says, My God is stronger, and there is no God that's stronger than my God. You see what he's saying there? Okay, and then afterwards, okay, they, they, they throw them into the fiery furnace, and the king is looking in, and he says, wait a minute, didn't we just throw three guys in? But there's a fourth one. And, and he says there, of the fourth one, he says, the fourth one is like a son of God. Do you see that? So in other words, what Nebuchadnezzar saw in the fire was a kingly figure. And he wasn't being burned at all. So he was being protected by his God. He was a son of God, a king who was a son who had a stronger God. And he associated this yeah. God with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So look at verse 28 at the end. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted him and set aside the king's command. And yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree. See, this is what he's doing. Okay, Nebuchadnezzar is a shrewd guy. He says, my god's the strongest. And then he realizes, whoops, the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is stronger. So i got to make an alliance with him. Verse 29, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses laid in ruins. For there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. So he begins by mocking. He says, there's no God greater than my God. What are you saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? And then he sees it, and he goes, whoa, I need to be in alliance with this God. And that's what the kings did in the Old Testament. They made an alliance with a god. And the king became the son of God. 
So in Psalm 2, uh, God is talking there about, uh, about his anointed one, that uh, the, the one that he's going to anoint as the king over all of the earth in verse 2. And then he says in verse 6, I have set my king on Mount Zion. Okay, so God calls him my king. And then in verse 7, he, he calls this king my son. Then later in the psalm, he tells all of the nations of the world, it says, you need to serve the Lord, serve the king that I have set there, and kiss the son. Kissing the son is, is the image of bowing down and uh, paying homage and worship and kissing the ring of the, the conquering king and God, who is the son of God. So you see that whole picture being there together. So again, when, you, when we come to Israel, things are a little bit different because Israel was formed as a nation because God sought Abraham out and they formed this nation. And he made the promise to them that everyone would become a king and a priest within that nation. So that's totally different than, than the world. Because you only have one king, it's the guy at the top, and he is the only one who is the son of, of God. But now God says, I'm going to create this nation, and from this nation you're all going to be sons of God. You're all going to be royalty, you're all going to be kings, and, and you're all going to act as priests. To picture that for them, they actually had a physical king. So it started with Saul, then David, then Solomon, and then the kingdom divided, and there was all these other kings, and, but you had the dynasty of David. And you, you read through the Old Testament, and, and you read the, that whenever God is referred to, he's not so much ref alone, but he's the God of Abraham. He's the God of Isaac. He's the God of Jacob. He's the God of David. He's the God of, of Israel. He's the God of the Hebrews. He's, he's the God of somebody to represent this, this, re, this alliance relationship between a God and his people, generally through the son who would be the king. But Israel is going to be different because God is going to separate them all out. And because they were born into the... Um, and um, and uh, but Israel is, is going to, they're going to be this nation not because they are Israelites, not because they have a king, but because they're born into the family of God. So we have this difference. Now, now that uh, Romans eight fourteen for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. They become sons by faith, and they're kings and priests now within the family of God. So it's not individuals, but it's everybody. So we, in the New Testament, we talk about the priesthood of the uh, family of God, the priesthood of believers. Now, how many have heard of that phrase before? Okay, yeah, so this is what it's talking about, is that, that we don't need one man representing us before God, which is what the priest does, or, or, um, but that we all can come to God because we're all treated as priests. But we also have this relationship whereby we are sons. So he's our God because of faith. We have a relationship with the Creator God. We're at peace with God. And that, of course, is the theme of the first 11 verses of chapter 5. We're sons of God. We're in the realm of the Spirit. Okay? We were in the realm of sin and of death, but now we're in the realm of the Spirit, the Spirit of life. We're in the realm of, of God. We are at peace with God and uh, um, at peace with the Creator. We are also the adopted children of God. Okay, so God goes a little further and he says, not only are you going to have this relationship where I am your God of power, but I'm also your God as, I'm going to be your God as a father. But not just in, a, in, a, uh, in an external sense, I'm going to act like a father to you, uh, like a big brother to a, a younger brother or a big sister to a, to a younger person where you don't have this real relationship. He says, but I'm actually going to adopt you. So not only am I giving you my spirit, but in giving you my spirit, I now adopt you so that you and I become as though we are one. We have a family relationship. And, and that's uh, what he's talking about. So he's not only, not only our God, but he is our father. He's our protector, our provider. He loves us and he, just in the same way that he loves his only begotten son. And of course, that's the, the essence um, that is picked up that 
uh, is identified in the cry that the Spirit makes us cry in our hearts. Abba, Father. Okay, again, we, we have so misused that over the years. So when he's saying Abba, it, it's not Abba, it's Father, Father. But it's not just Father, Father, it's Father God, because Abba was used in prayers to, as a term to, to set God in its highest position as, as not just Lord, but the Creator, the Father of all creation. So he, we're saying, Father, Creator, God, and then Father. So we have both relationships identified there in this term. Um, it's how we address God in our prayers. He is Father God. So the best way, I think, to translate it, again, if we literally translated it, it would be Father, Father. But if we translate it by its meaning, uh, because we don't have the, they, ha they understood the meaning right away. We don't get that. It was, uh, it was um, Abba Pater. That means nothing to us. But it meant every, what it meant to them was Father God and Father So we were the sons of God, we're the children of God, we are heirs of something, verse 17 is telling us. There is an inheritance that is coming to us. And again, if you look in the context there, go to verse 23, so we're back in Romans 8. Verse 23, what does it say? In the context, what is the something that we're going to inherit? The inheritance is? Redemption of our the redemption of our bodies. Now it says the, the adoption as sons and the redemption of our bodies. So what it's saying is not only have we been adopted now, but we don't have the fullness yet of what it means to be adopted. Because our bodies still die in this state that we are adopted in now. But there's coming a day when our bodies are going to bring, come back to life. They're going to live forever. The redemption of of our bodies, and the word redemption there is is actually um, uh, where is it here? It's um, deliverance, the deliverance of our body. What's our body delivered from? Death. From death. Because <clears throat> what's the problem right now with our bodies? They die, and we're going to be delivered. This is the redemption. This this is the inheritance that we're getting. So the context here is not of everything that we can get once we get to heaven, but it is specifically the redemption, the deliverance of our bodies. So now look, look at verse 17 again. So this is where I was going, that we need to get this connection. Verse 17 literally says, indeed we suffer together. Okay? Indeed we suffer together. Um, or, we, or we die together in order that we may also be glorified together. So he's saying that even though we are sons of God and we're children of God, we are still going to die. But because we are together in Christ, we will be glorified together. So what's he talking about here? To be glorified, right? What is that? To, that's the day of the resurrection. It's the deliverance of our body. Okay, that's when our bodies are redeemed, when our bodies are delivered. So this whole section from verse uh, 18 to 30 is about the glorification of our bodies. When our bodies come back to life. When they are made into eternal bodies. Life unending bodies. I right, know what I want you to see here, and, and uh, we're running out of time now. But I, I want you to see... Uh, three things, hope, groan, and glory. Right? So um, hope is our present situation. We have this hope. We have this hope from when we were saved. Verse 24, for in this hope we were saved. So saved is a past event. And when we were saved, we were given this hope. And, and that's our current situation. But as we're waiting patiently, because that's what it says. Look at verse 19. The creation waits in verse 21, it says the creation is in hope. Okay, the, So this hope always brings waiting. Look at verse 24. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is not, um, is not seen is not hope. For what, who hopes for what he sees? But we hope for what we do not see. We wait for it with patience. Okay, So hope implies patient endurance. So it's coming. But we have to be patient. We have to endure until it gets here. So it's important we understand 
that concept there. Then the next thing is groaning. Uh, we groan. So in verse uh, 20, uh, 22 and 23, we know that the whole creation has been groaning. It is groaning. It's in agony. And it says the type of groaning that it is, is it's the same type of groaning that a woman has when she's giving birth to a child. Okay, And this is the picture. Um, that uh, Verse 23, not only the creation, but we ourselves are groaning. Okay, because it hasn't come. And it's been a long time. It's been over 2,000 years now since, since the promise was made. And, and back, back then in the first century, they were thinking that the second coming of Christ, the day of resurrection, was going to be so close to the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, but then it didn't happen. And they've been waiting and waiting and waiting. And so I've got this hope. But man, my endurance is running thin. My patience is running, is running thin. And I'm groaning. I'm longing for this. And we keep having our loved ones die. So, and we're seeing death all around us. And it's, and it's painful. And it's hard to live. So, <clears throat> so there's this groaning through this whole process. And then, um, um, then down in verse 26, it says, The Spirit Himself intercedes with us with groanings. So here we have hope. We've been given hope at the moment of our salvation. But that hope involves eagerly waiting with expectation. But that waiting is difficult. Because while we are waiting, we are having to battle our own weaknesses. We have to battle our weaknesses. Look at verse 26. The Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. What are the weaknesses? Verse 23, what's our first weakness? Or verse 13, rather. Sin. Hmm? Sin. Sin, yeah. The, the deeds of the body. <coughs> Those things that we got to put to death. That is hard work doing this. Okay, but chapter 6 says it doesn't matter. If we are in the Spirit, in Christ, we've died with Him, we've raised with Him, we have this newness of life because we have the Spirit of God living us, and the Spirit gives us the power and the ability to overcome sin. Okay, so we're not slaves to sin any longer. Sin is no longer our master. We are not under the realm of sin. We've been delivered from that. We are living in the realm of the Spirit, the realm of life. Okay, all of that's in chapter 6, and then it illustrates it directly with the Jewish people in, in chapter 7 to, to show them that, hey, under that law, you are under the realm of sin. And, and the law accomplished its purpose. And you were slave to that sin, and this is what it looked like. You wanted to obey God, you wanted to follow the rules, but you couldn't do it. Because it proved the law was not there to give you righteousness but to show that you are not righteous and need a Savior. So, um, uh, th this is the, the weaknesses that we have. And, and then we have weaknesses in, in, that, in, in that when our loved one dies, sometimes the grief overcomes us. It overwhelms us. And, 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 uh, and, and uh, we, we end up in such sorrow that, that sometimes we can't live. And, and even Christians, when they get to near the end of their lives and they're facing death, what do they do? They, they can't seem to, they can't seem to die well. Do you understand what I'm saying? And, and all of these things are part of our weaknesses. We need strength to help us to be able to overcome during that time. So, what happens? We're groaning. We're groaning because of our sin. We're groaning because it seems to be taking so long. We want that day of resurrection to come, but it's not coming. And we can tend to become uh, impatient. We can, we can be uh, overcome with the grief and the death all around us. And uh, um, that we mourn people rather than glorying in their death. And that's the, the best thing about being a Christian. When, it, when a Christian dies, when a loved one dies, yeah, th there's a sorrow. But we don't just sorrow in that. We have sorrow because of the parting. But then we have glory in their death because their parting takes them to the next part. Right? It takes them to the next part. So we rejoice in that. Uh, <clears throat> all right, so the, um, this, this whole thing then... Uh, <coughs> 
so that the Spirit intervenes with us. He goes with us. He's going to help us through all of this groaning, this time between the two events. Justification and our glorification. Let me show you how, how that is. So, uh, if you look at... Um, um, Let's go to verse 17b again. So we're sons of God, we're children of God, we have an inheritance as sons and children. He says there that we suffer together. Um, and what he's saying there is that we will die. We still physically die. We all die. Physically the body will die. We saw last time that this is what Paul's meaning is here. That it's not suffering um, persecution. It's not even suffering the hardships of life, even though those are part of it. But specifically here the context is that we are going to die. Because again, he's contrasting the fact that our bodies physically die. And our hope is not attached to the death. But our hope is attached to the fact that when they physically die, one day they're going to physically be resurrected and come back to life. Okay, that's where our hope is. And that's what we're longing for. That's what we're groaning for. That's, that's the thing that we pray that is going to happen. We're getting tired sometimes, okay? So, um, for, so, um, um, so, you, so again, look at verse 17. The purpose of dying, he says, is that we may also be glorified. That's the purpose of suffering death. So we will be glorified. That's why it's not a bad thing for us. Um, Remember again, the words with him in verse 17 are not in the Greek text. In fact, I think it's a good idea if you scratch them right out of there. We die together in order that we may also be glorified together. That's what it says. God did not just make his people his nation. He made his children to, uh, made us children to guarantee our glorification. Now, Although glory is mentioned only three times here in verses 18 to 30, it is actually the overarching theme, as I've already said. So look at verse 18. Verse 18 says, it begins with glory that is to be revealed to us. And then jump over to verse 30, the end of verse 30. Those he justified, he will also what? Glorify. Okay? He also glorified. Okay, so that there's an inclusion here. And the inclusion marks this noticeable shift from verse 17b, which is the present status of our, of our inheritance. We are sons of God, but we're also children of God with an inheritance. And that inheritance is an eternal living body. And, uh, and so it, begin, it begins from there. That's our present situation. We don't have that body yet. But that's our present situation. That's our hope that we have. And uh, But in verse 18, this glory is going to be revealed in us. So there's a day coming when we will receive that new body. Now it says there, this glory that is to be revealed to us. The, um, the, the, uh, um, the preposition that is used there is actually the preposition in. So it's in us. Okay, the glory that's to be revealed is in us. I think the ESV probably said to us because they're thinking of all of the glorious things that we're going to receive. That how glorious heaven is going to be in the new heaven and the new earth. And that's all true, but again, the context is not speaking to that. It's speaking specifically to the transformation, the glorification of our physical bodies after they have died. And he says that that glory is going to be revealed in us. In, in us in, in a power and in a way that our bodies are raised from the dead and are given life. And then, uh, <clears throat> okay, so, the, so that's the focus of these verses. So again, look at verse 18. I consider that the sufferings of this present time, okay, what are the sufferings of the present time? It's again that we're dying. And I think that's what he's referring to. Uh, that we we are dying. This is this is our great suffering. I come to Christ in faith, but I still die. Why well, why do we still die? Well, back to chapter uh, five, verse twelve. Why do we die? Because Adam sinned, and the punishment of Adam's sin is that he will physically die, and everybody born after him. Why do we physically die? Because Adam 
sin. We have to understand that. Why will we be resurrected? Because Jesus rose from the dead. Adam is the first man who brought death. Christ is the second Adam who brings resurrected life. You have to see that parallel. Okay? And, uh, uh, <clears throat> and uh, so the reason we're going to be resurrected is because Jesus rose from the dead. But the reason we die in the first place is because Adam sinned and the punishment of God was that the day that you eat this fruit is the day that you will die. So it's not so much the exterior glory, um, but an interior glory that transforms us out of death. Look, look at verse 24. Uh, verse 24, for in this hope we are saved. Saved again is, is a past definitive action. And then in hope. So in hope is, is the state in which we now live waiting with anticipation and, in, and assurance of the culmination of God's plan for us and for the world. That is the glory to be revealed in us. Okay, we were saved in the hope of the resurrection of the body. Then this all, all of this focus again, that it's all about the physical body and physical body coming back to life. It, it just, to me, it just reinforces um, the fact that those who are not in Christ, their bodies physically die, but I think it reinforces the fact that they will not be resurrected. At least their bodies will not be resurrected. They will not have bodies in the future. But again, that's, that's um, uh, not concrete. Verse 19, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revelation of the sons of God. So Paul's saying that creation has this expectant waiting, just like a, a mother who is expecting a child to be born. And, and, and why, is, why, is the, um, why is creation doing this? It's verse 20. For the creation was subjected to futility. Okay, the creation, the world, it was in submission to futility. What is futility? It's uselessness. Okay, the creation could not do anything to redeem mankind. But in fact, creation became part of death. So everything in creation out there dies. Trees die, the flowers die, the grass dies, everything dies. The birds die, the animals die. There's death everywhere around us. And it is, it, life it seems is just a mist. It's the same word that is used in Ecclesiastes for vanity or mist. It's just, it's there for a moment and like a breath, it's gone in the next. Okay? It, it, there, there's no, doesn't seem like there's any purpose to anything. And then that's why so many philosophies in this world today uh, focus on that. That light, they look at the world and they see all this death and, and futility and they say, it's useless. There can't be anything more. Okay? Or if there is something more, then, then, then it's, got, it's something we've got to earn. And that's how all of the philosophies of the world are built on, on both of those thoughts. Okay, so the creation, he says, was subjected to futility, but not willingly. A, the, just think of it, when God created, six days he created, and he created the, the air, all of the planets, and the sun, and the moon, and the stars, and, and uh, created the seas, and the land, and then the animals, and, and then mankind. And all of it, all of it is subject, to, has been affected by this, this curse. The, you know, the, the, everything in creation obeys God, except man. You ever know that? God put the stars in place. They do its thing. They do everything that God told it to do. Even the animals, in a sense, they they have what we call uh, um, instinct. instinct. It's not <coughs> instinct. They're doing what God's telling them. And they obey. They obey the instinct. They obey God. What is man do? See, we, we, we can't do that. But the creation was subjected to this now willingly. Um, it didn't choose to become futile. It didn't choose to be to be, um, uh, be dying in every respect. It says, um, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. Now there's a little bit of confusion among scholars whether the him should be a capital H or a small h. So if it's a small h, who are they thinking? Adam. They're thinking Adam. And there's an element of truth to that. Because death came into this world because Adam sinned. 
That's what he, Paul's already said in, in Romans 5.12. He says, but if it's a capital H, who is it? It's God. Why, why would it be God? Because God is the one who gave the judgment. God said, look, Adam, you sinned, then death is coming to you and all of the world. And, and so we go all the way back to, to Genesis chapter 3, and what do we see? See, the, the, the women, women are going to have pain in childbirth. Men are going to have to... They go go out to plant their seed. And they're gonna find out, man. There's rocks. There's weeds. I gotta work. I gotta work hard. By the sweat of my brow now, I gotta find food. It doesn't come naturally anymore. It's not. It's not there to pick off the tree. But I gotta. I gotta work for it. And, and the weeds and the thorns and the thistles and all this stuff. And and um, so God did. I think is probably. Well, I don't know. I can go with it either way. Uh, whether it's God or whether it's Adam. But the thing is, is that creation didn't, it didn't happen to creation willingly. <clears throat> Verse 21, in hope, uh, um, so, I, so again, you look at the second law of thermodynamics, which is the law of, of entropy, atrophy, 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 entropy, entropy, entropy. entropy. I think you'll find that atrophy is also what it can be used as. But yeah. Your face, like, when your muscles are Anyways, you all know what it means. It means that everything is declining, everything's falling apart, everything's dying, right? Okay, it, 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 it all seems to be part of creation being subjected to futility that God subjected creation to. But then He says He did it all in hope. Well, so he, He's personifying creation now, and He says creation has hope. So I, they may be part of that curse, and they may be affected by curse, but he, it's in hope, verse 21, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption. Now, it's actually, in the, in the Greek there, it's not bondage uh, to corruption, but it's, it's two things. It uh, will be set free from its bondage, from slavery, and free from corruption. But the word there is actually not corruption, but decomposition. So what's decomposition? Death. It's death. That's what happens to our bodies when it dies. That's what happens when, when, with everything that you bury into the ground, it dies, it decomposes. Okay, so the, the, the thing is, is that the, the creation, um, everything that's buried in the creation eventually dies, but it has this hope that the bodies of Christians who are buried in the earth are not going to be, they're going to decompose, but at some point in time in the future, they're going to be brought to freedom in the glory of the children of God in the resurrection. So when God's children are glorified, so is creation uh, set free from its futility from that reign of sin and death. So he says in verse 22, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. So here we have the image of a of a um, mother who is pregnant, um, but the labor has set in. So she's having labor. But it didn't last for an hour or two hours or eight hours. Okay? Creation is in, is in labor, but it's been in labor since the beginning of time, since the beginning of, of, of the sin, since the promise was first given. It's been hope waiting eagerly for this hope this deliverance of all of the bodies that have died and decomposed in her and is wanting to give birth to the sons of God. You see how, how that picture is there? And um, she's, she's um, one day the baby's going to be born and the earth being pregnant with all of these dead bodies of Christians and corpses of those who have died and it uh, so desperately wants them to be resurrected. What I think Paul is saying here is that just as Adam's sin brought death and futility to this world, this is all going to be reversed, and one day humans are going to rise again and occupy an earth that will be free of all decay and futility. He's just describing the hope for us. Okay? Why is Paul doing this here? Why is this focus on the glory and the resurrection of the body? Because he's already gone through this whole thing with the Jewish Christians. He says, look, you guys... You, you guys the old covenant is no longer part of your life. The old covenant is a covenant of death. It is the thing that actually condemns you to death. It is under the realm of sin. And you're not there anymore. 
So why do you want to keep going back there? Why do you want to, to tie yourself up and put yourself in bondage to those things again? It says those things don't even have a hope uh, of resurrection. But in Christ over here, being in, in, the, in the realm of the Spirit, in the realm of grace, that's where you have the hope. And it's not tied to the law at all. It's not tied to being a Jew at all. It's totally separate for it. And let me tell you about this, how wondrous and great this is. Because over here, your body's going to die and rot and decay. But over here, your body's going to come back to life. And that's Paul's focus here. So verse 23, he says, not only is creation groaning, verse 23, um, but we ourselves who have the first for the Spirit, we're groaning inwardly as we wait. So we're the same thing. We, we as Christians, we long for that day. How many of you know when the day of resurrection is coming? Anybody? Nobody? Why? Why don't you know? Because God didn't tell you. Do you want it to come? Do you long for it to come? Yeah. Do you, do you groan and pray? God, bring it now. You know, may today be the day of resurrection. Okay? Those are the kinds of things we're praying about. But uh, we, we groan inwardly. We wait eagerly for our adoption as sons for the redemption of our body. So we're suffering that atrophy, that that uh, decay, that pain. Our bodies are in travail. We're wishing that this baby would be born. Uh, this, um, of course, that is the redemption of our bodies. So then again, he says, verse 24, in this hope we were saved. So reminding us again that, that at salvation, we were justified and we were glorified, but not in reality yet. Okay, it's the now not yet principle. We're now glorified because we have the Spirit of God, we have the promise of, of resurrection, uh, but it doesn't happen until a day in the future. So we can live today in the power of the Spirit and, and uh, confidently saying that we're going to be resurrected. Okay, uh, the, the phrase there, first fruits of the Spirit, there's lots of, of different opinions as to what it is. Is it talking about the Spirit being the first fruit? So that we only have part of what the Spirit does for us. And, and at the day of resurrection, we're going to get more uh, from, what this, from what the Spirit provides for it. Or is it talking about, about the first fruits as the blessings that the Spirit brings to us? That He's only brought us some things at this time, and then He's going to give us more things. Well, it could be both. And it, I, to me, I don't think it really makes any matter. But what, it, what His point is, is that, that we only have a partial thing now. We have the partial thing with promise. And that gives us hope. And there is coming a day when it will be totally and completely fulfilled. And if you, if you look back at verse 10, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. So we're all going to die. But, it, but the spirit in you is life because of righteousness. Okay? The spirit is resurrection life. So we have the spirit now who is helping us to win the battles over the deeds of the body, over sin, who's, who is groaning with us to help us to be able to, to, um, to persevere in the hardships of this life. But that spirit is also going to be the spirit of resurrection. So that he is the one that is the power that's going to resurrect our bodies. And, and, and that's coming someday in the future. So this ability to put away the deeds of the body is the first fruits. Uh, but there's coming more work of the Spirit in which He's then going to co totally and completely deliver us from not only our bondage, our slavery to sin's corruption, but also our corruption, the decomposition that comes through death. This is our hope. Okay, verse 24, for this is the hope that we are saying. Now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees. Okay, so again, just looking at so if 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 I'm hoping that when I turn 16, my dad is going to give me a car, well, I'm already almost 70, and when I turned 16, my dad did give me a car. I saw it. It was right there. I had it. I had the keys in my hand. I had that car. So it's no longer hope, you see. Until my 16th birthday, I was hoping. But when the 16th birthday came and he gave me the keys, it's no longer hope. So I don't hope that I'm getting a car when I'm 16 because it already happened. You see, that's what he's saying. So, so, so he, says, uh, he says, God has promised us <clears throat> resurrection. And, and we hope for that. We know it's going to happen. But it, it's not because we have it. Because he's still in the future. So his focus, his emphasis here, because there are a lot of people at this time when Paul was writing that were saying, 
uh, saying, hey, it's already happened. It's already happened. And they're going, how come it happen? Do you remember, uh, remember first, um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1? Okay? So I'm writing to you because, because some have told you that the second coming has already happened. Christ hasn't come yet. Okay? So we've got to keep on hoping because it's still in the future. Right? When, when they thought that it already happened, what did they do? They gave up hope. They lost all hope. And we don't do that. So his whole focus of verses 24 and 25 in this whole thing about hope is that, verse 25, we hope for what we do not see. We're hoping for the fulfillment of the promise and we wait for it with what? Patience. Patience. With patience. With patience. We endure. We endure. Um, the day is still coming. We've been raised with Christ now, but we still die. And one day we will be raised uh, and this hope of resurrection will be ours permanently. Go back and read chapter 6, verses 4 to 9. Okay, verse 26. We've got, we've got, we've got, we've got two more verses. So likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. So I've already talked about this. So the weaknesses that we have, we have sin that still, uh, the, the deeds of our body, the desires of our body, um, that, that, that give in to temptation. Okay, we gotta we gain we can gain victory over these things, and the Holy Spirit is, is helping us to gain victory in those things. But the Holy Spirit also helps us to persevere. Okay, for it is uh, um, what does he say here? Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. Okay, when I translated it, this is the way I translated it. In the same way. Also, the Spirit helps us, our weakness helps us in our weaknesses. For in so far as it is necessary, we should pray for those things that we have not perceived. Okay, just coming off of verse 25. Okay, he's talking about it's in the future. We don't have it. It's still there. We haven't perceived it yet. We don't see it in reality. It's still in the future. And now he says here in verse 26, so it's necessary that we still keep praying for that day to come. Um, it's still... That's because it hasn't come yet. We haven't perceived it. And then he says, For the Spirit himself will certainly intercede over us with inexpressible groanings. So the Spirit is, is interceding for us. Now this word interceding, there's actually um, two meanings in which it is used. It, it, means, to, to inter, it means to intervene uh, by coming between two things. So this is the general idea of, of uh, interceding. Coming between two things. Well, what two things is the context we're talking about? Between the hope and the despair. Okay. We have hope, but it's so far out there. It hasn't happened yet. Okay. We're all going for it. But what can, what's the, the temptation? What's the weakness? Despair. So the Holy Spirit comes between those two things, hope and despair, to help us to continue the hope and not to despair. And you see that? And the other way he intervenes is, is by coming between two points of time. Well, what two points of time would he talk about? Look at verse 30. What are the two points of time that he's talking about? Between justification yeah, between justification <laughs> and glorification. Exactly. It's the now and the not yet aspect. So, so um, he, he intervenes between those two periods. So he's our helper. He's, our, he's the one who's going to help us to persevere. Um, the other thing is that, that he comes between uh, two events. So, uh, well, that's actually the, the two events is the justification and our glorification. Okay. The two periods of time is the now and the not yet. So that's what, what hope, uh, that's what the Spirit of God does with it. So what does it mean? What does it mean practically? It means that, that we as Christians, we can still pray that Christ would come today. We, 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 we can pray for deliverance today. Even though we don't know when it is. And, and uh, it will help. So look at verse 27 because this, sinks, this solidifies it. It says, and he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now again, there's, there's conflict here as to whether the second Spirit should be a capital S or a small S. Uh, for a while, 
I thought it should be a capital S, the, the same way as the ESV did it. But I more and more, the more I studied it, the more I'm convinced that the second one should be a small spirit. So it should be this way. Listen, listen. And while searching hearts, he knows what is the thoughts of our spirit. Because according to God's will, he intercedes for the saints. Okay, so we, we can pray about future things, and we can pray that they will happen, that they'll come. But we don't know the time. God knows. And what the Spirit does is He gives us, He solidifies our hope because He knows what the heart's intention is. And God answers us by giving us perseverance. Do you, do you see that? Do you understand what it's saying there? So the, the Spirit intercedes for the saints by giving us perseverance during this time. We don't know when it's going to happen. But it's going to happen, and I'm praying for it as though it's going to happen tomorrow. Okay? Deliver us now. Okay? And we can do that for any eschatological point of view. Uh, God is going to do it. Well, let me bring this to an end here. I was uh, <clears throat> I was watching the um, uh, the recent episode of Nisus. Anybody follow? Oh, oh yeah, I keep calling it Nisus. It's NCIS. NCIS. <laughs> I call it Nisus. <coughs> I was watching the recent episode of NCIS. Um, Dr. Mallard had died, and throughout the episode, they uh, they they kept doing flashbacks to things that he said. And here's one of the things that. Dr. Mallard told young Jimmy, he said, if you're going through hell, keep going. I, I thought that, well, that's really cool. Because sometimes our lives are, are take on a hellish appearance. They're pretty hard sometimes, aren't they? And, and what does a Christian do? You give up? No, we don't give up. Hmm? Then you end up staying in hell. That's right, you end up staying in hell. Okay? You no, know, you persevere through. Because what does the Spirit do? We're praying for the end. Oh, God, may deliver me from this today and bring the day of resurrection today. Fulfill my hope that is in you today. We can pray that because the Spirit knows the intention of our heart and He helps us to persevere, okay? Knowing that our longings are still for something that is in the future for we continue the hope. Another thing that Dr. Mallard said, he says, if you listen, the dead will speak. I don't know if you've ever noticed in the show that he's a, he is a, uh, an autopsy doctor at, at, uh, a cor a coroner, and uh, but he always talks to the dead, and he says that the, the dead body is going to speak, going to give them the answers as to why they died, what happened to them, and, and it's so true. When you go to a Christian's funeral, do you see the Christian's body laying there? What's it saying to you? They're not there. Well, it says they're not there, but it, it says. Have hope. Why? Because he's not going to stay dead. This body may, may decompose, but it's not going to stay decomposed. It's going to rise again. Have hope. Okay? Um, remember this, okay? So yesterday is over. What do we do at funerals? So often go, oh, I remember yesterday. I remember my loved one. It was so great. I, and I'm really missing them. You know what? We, it's okay to think back, think that way, but you got to add. Yesterday is over. Okay? And the uh, as sad as that really as that seems to us, because we're the ones that are here. We, we have the pain of the part of the departure, right? But we have what are we? What was it telling us? Change is the essence of life. Death is just taking us to that next stage. We're not. We're not just going to die. We're, we're going to die. To change into a new life, okay, and uh, and so when you look at the dead, your dead loved one there, it's not oh man they're gone, they're gone forever. Okay? It is they're going on to the next stage of life, and uh, we'll be joining them in our glory. So we don't mourn their departure; we're actually grateful for it, right? Yeah, dying in this world is hard. and It's part of this. And as a Christian, when you're dying, when you're going through this, you've got to focus on the hope that you have. 
You got a focus there that, hey, I'm closer today than I ever was before. And this is going to be the best thing. Yeah, it's going to bring sorrow to my family, but they're Christians and they know that yesterday is over and we're looking to tomorrow. We're looking to that hope and the Spirit's going to help us to persevere. We're not going to be over. That's why Paul said we don't mourn like the world mourns. I'm trying to talk to my mom about, about this and she says, you're so harsh. And I said, I'm, I'm not meaning, it. We only, I only sound harsh because you're thinking of it from a world's point of view. He said, the best thing in the world for a Christian is they die. You understand what I'm saying? Is that that's our hope. That is. Hoping for something that we're going to drink. Yeah. <clears throat> so when, um, at the end of the, the NCIS show, there, uh, Denozo comes and he sees Jimmy and, and Jimmy's going to give the eulogy for Dr. Ballard. And Jimmy says, stories are all we have at the end. Just the stories we leave behind. And Denozo says, no, no, we have the lives that we teach while we are here. The people that we leave behind. You see, see, that's what I'm doing. Because one of these days, I'm, I'm going to probably die, maybe not before all of you, but most of you. <laughs> okay? and, and, and what I want is, is, is not to think of all the stories about Cliff and I. Oh, he loved the Maple Leafs and stuff like that. I want, I want you to be able to say, man, this is what Cliff taught me about hope. Cliff taught me how, how to look death square in, in its face and say, say, you're not an enemy. You're, you're, you're just the, the door to the next life. And that's what God has for us. All right. Let me, let me end there and we'll pick it up next time in verse... Uh, uh, verse 28. And, and of course, you all want to hear about verse 28, don't you? Because 28 is the, is the verse that we all go to when th things go hard. Right? So you'll see how it fits into that context. All right. Declan, you can...